Awesome. That's great. Um, okay, then let's get the ball rolling. Um, thanks everybody for coming back for uh, the second uh, second day and the second half of Gimex. Uh, we had a fantastic morning. Bob, we've got equally got a fantastic uh, afternoon lined up as well. Um, we've got Alex Burnett with us, a uh, junior designer from uh, Calway. He um, only graduated last year and uh, obviously very interesting times in the journey you've been had since graduating to where you are now. So um, you can see some applause coming up for you there, Alex. <laughs> so um, whenever you feel ready, you just, just go for it. All right. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, so uh, I'll just introduce myself in a second when the slide comes up. But first of all, yeah, welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of the journey into hyper casual. So my journey from yeah university into hyper casual, and then I'm also going to talk about hyper casual games itself. So yeah, I'll first talk about who I am, my journey, what hyper casual games are, how we design them at Quali. And then finally, what it's like to be a designer working on hyper casual games. So let's get straight to the introduction. Yeah, so I'm Alexander Burnett. As John said, I graduated only last year and um, I started working in industry from October onwards. And um, yeah, so I was studying computer game design. I did this on sandwich year. And now, I'm working as a junior game designer at Quality on hyper casual games for mobile, so App Store and Google Play. So my journey into the industry. So for this topic, I thought over a lot and I thought the main thing I could go over is just the main aspects I think helped me sort of get to where I am and to my sort of position I am currently. So I'm going to go through each aspect and explain how it helped and sort of my experience with that. So placements, it's I understand, you know, we're in a weird climate at the moment and it's, you know, it's very different on like anything we've had before. But I thought, although it being the case, I still wanted to talk about placements because it was a very big part of um, me, sort of, you know, growing up and sort of becoming sort of a professional in, in the industry. And I was very lucky that I got a 12 month placement at a, a mobile game studio in Amsterdam called Cool Games. And they create uh, mobile games for well, obviously the app stores, but also for uh, platforms such as Facebook and um, other social me media websites that run on HTML. And so I was an intern game designer there. Yeah, so for the following reasons, I, this is one of the best life experiences I've ever had. So first of all, I'd never lived abroad before on my own. Uh, and the first time I was doing it, I was doing it for 12 months. So there's a lot of, sort of learning on my feet and you know, always sort of trying to make sure I sort of move forward and sort of keep going. And as well as that, I'd never worked in a studio before, especially not long term. So um, it was a very valuable experience for both these reasons. And the biggest one for working in a studio is you get to work on titles that are being published. So while I was there, they had sort of titles that I could work on content updates for, so titles that are already released. But then I got to work on titles that were still coming up, and so I helped have an impact on design and it feels it really feels you have sort of more responsibility when you know that this is going to be published people have to play it so you feel responsible to make sure that it's the best it possibly can be and I've already kind of covered it but yeah just working in studios unlike anything else obviously you get really close to it because you work in group projects all the time right so you work with multiple disciplines work with programmers artists designers and you still need to learn how to work in a team because you need all those disciplines to make that single game and that single vision. So for context, when I was at Cool Games, some of the titles I got to work on were, first of all, Hasbro's Battleship. So that's a Facebook Insta Games title. And what that means is you can play it on Facebook Messenger against your friends. And so I got to work on sort of several sort of new designs. Like the, gap, the, game, the, game, the game itself was already out, but I got to work on sort of new content updates and sort of give feedback and sort of notes on where I think it could go in the future. The other two games that I got to work on amongst others were uh, Cookie Connect, which is a sort of HTML cookie uh, joining game where you join cookies of the same color. And the objective there is to completely, uh, you have a grid of cookies and you have to make sure that it's sort of they're empty by the end to progress. So by connecting them up, it removes them from the grid. And so for them, I got to work on uh, level updates. So 
there'd be new content updates and it would involve a certain number of levels. It was then my job to be the level designer and to create those levels for the game. Same also goes for Dual Academy. So Dual Academy is a match three game. And once again, like with Cookie Connect, I was a level designer. So I came up with new levels for future updates that would be released. So a few of the other experiences that I think are very important I should definitely mention is first of all, game jams. Uh, I attended the Global Game Jam a few times and especially for group project, uh, we used it as an opportunity to test out how we work together. So we actually worked on various aspects of our final game design to see, OK, how would it work if we have a set amount of time and we work on a project together? So we were using Unity. So, OK, can we get source control to work? Can we uh, work simultaneously on like similar levels or similar areas of the game? And it was a really sort of like a stress test to see how well we could do that together. So I would highly recommend Go Game Jams because as well as testing that out, it's also just a lot of fun to see what you can come up with within say 24 hours or 48 hours. So I'd highly recommend it. As well as that, I've already kind of moved into it, but group projects. So our final group project was an amazing experience. And as I said, it was very much a sort of learning teamwork skills. And you, know, you have group projects throughout university, right? So use those to your advantage, like learn how to talk to these different disciplines, how to work together and what that involves. So being like a designer, you need to make sure that you're providing details that a programmer or an artist would need and vice versa. And the final one that I sort of put here is uh, joining communities and groups. So what I'm referring to there is after I left university, one of the first things I did was uh, I, I tried to start setting up sort of connections with people. And if you look at sort of Discord or Twitter, there, there are so many groups where it's full of industry professionals and they're showing their work, they're showing sort of in-development stuff. And this is very important because, first of all, it's completely free. And then you can see, OK, how are these artists in the industry presenting their work on their portfolio or just publishing it on, say, Discord or Twitter? And on top of that, they'll have like job boards. So you can see what jobs are being posted as well as just you can get feedback on your own work. Show your work there. You'll get sort of suddenly 10, 15 different artists seeing it and giving feedback on maybe this way you can change the colour or there's something in your design that isn't right. And uh, I found it really helpful when I was working on personal projects to help to build up my portfolio after university. And yes, that leads me on to the, the main one being portfolio. I know it seems like an obvious one, but I just really had to cover this because it's so important. Um, my portfolio was definitely one of the reasons why maybe I got certain interviews or sort of certain uh, emails or sort of kind of communications with companies. By showing my work on here, I could, they could see what have I done before and what I'm able to do. Now, yes, I'm a junior game designer, but I actually started off by being a 3D artist. I was very keen on doing 3D art. And although I had a 3D art background, it still helped me with, with uh, getting the role for junior game designer at Quali, and I'll go into that in a bit. So first thing I want to say about portfolios is make sure it's easy to find. Sounds like an obvious tip, but definitely consider it. Uh, if you have, say, like LinkedIn or Twitter, make sure you've got your portfolio linked on there. Uh, especially with like LinkedIn, if you're posting work, make sure that if they click your name and go to your profile, they can very easily be linked to the rest of your content. And on top of that, make sure you're sharing updates. So one thing I did before the end of university is I started working on some personal projects on the side. And even with university work and those personal projects, I would publish frequent updates on these social media platforms because it just gets more eyes on it. And yes, you get feedback, but on top of that, it's just people are noticing your work. And the more content you have out there, the more easier it is to be spotted. So when you're publishing these posts, make sure then you have links to your portfolio so they can find the rest of it. Make it as easy as possible. You want to really take the effort out of finding your content. And this is the one I wanted to mention. This was my uh, final group project. This one, uh, helped me become like a junior game designer for the reason that it showed I could do level design. Yes, I was also a 3D artist on the project, but I helped come up with the initial sort of layout and design of obstacles and how the level should be laid out in general. So especially at working quality, I work on designing levels now. And so this got mentioned a bit by my uh, sort of head of design. He said, well, I, I saw this game and I saw you could do level design because you had to sort of work this out. So would you now help and do some level design? And of course, I was very much up for it. So very wordy, but I'm going to read it out 
Um, so this is just covering what hypercasual games are, and then I'm going to sort of break this down into the main words or phrases that really sort of stand out to me. So this is a quote by Nikita Selenov of Gamma Sutra, and um, what they say is, hypercasual games are games developed with a straightforward, minimalistic UI and UX design, usually on a free-to-play basis. They are easy to start, even for novices, without the need to learn long-read tutorials and so on. Hypercasual games offer high level of replayability, meaning that gamers can play them repeatedly. So straight away, here's what stands out to me. The words straightforward, minimalistic UI and UX, free to play, easy to start even for novices, and finally high level replayability. So three of them we can already get out of the way because they have the same objective in mind. Straightforward, minimalistic UI and UX, and easy to start for, even for novices. They all refer to make sure your game idea is easy understood from when players start playing it. So when you play any kind of hyper casual game on the market, you realize that you'll be able to pick it up very quickly. You don't need to start watching tutorials or go through this like long red uh, sort of tutorial like they explain here. You just have to make sure it's as straightforward as possible. But then that goes for all games. So the more straightforward it is, the easier it is for a player to get into it. On top of that, with hyper casual games, as they're mobile games, they are usually free to play. And so if you're designing a hyper casual game, you need to make sure you keep that in mind because at the end of the day, if you want to compete against these sort of large publishers, then your game has to be free as well. Because players won't consider a game, you know, and pay this sort of uh, entry fee to try it out when they can try out all these other apps that are being published all the time. But like every day, thousands of apps are being published. So just, uh, it's just something to keep in mind when you're designing for mobile. And finally, high level replayability. So any game idea you come up with on mobile, you need to make sure you can play it over and over. Especially with mobile games, you're looking at players doing lo loads and loads of short sessions. So they'll go away and they'll come back. And so you need to make sure that they're able to do that by making sure that whatever game you come up with, they can keep playing. It doesn't just come to an end or is suddenly not fun after the, the fifth level because you've run out of content or ideas. So just a few more examples of hyper casual games. I want to talk about, um, first of all, this one. This is Let's Be Cops by Kuali. The idea here is that you play the role of a police officer and you have a speed limit, which you can see on the road, which is like a sort of a usual speed uh, limit sign. And as cars go by, you have to scan them and see if they match the speed limit. And straight away, you can tell if cars are going above it, because yes, they'll be going faster, but then we color code it. So if there's a car going past the speed limit, the scan will show the number in orange. Or if it's going really high above it, it'll show it in red. But if the car's doing okay and it's under the speed limit, it'll show it in green. The reason why I think this is a great example of a hyper casual game is the fact that it's very straightforward. First of all, it pulls from real life, right? So everyone knows what a speed camera is and how it functions. So straight away, you're using that to your advantage because they don't have to come into this and learn what the game's about. They can already understand what's going on in the scene. Secondly, we've got a game called Blade Force 3D. Um, so this is a game where you, the whole objective is to forge a weapon and then to fight an opponent with that weapon. So in the top left and right, you can see what your uh, strength skill is and then what your enemy's strength is. And so the objective here is to beat your opponent and to then fight them in combat and see who wins. So this works for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, it's drawing from real life, like it's the role of a blacksmith creating a weapon. But on top of that, it's that sort of idea of making the player feel powerful. So at the end of it, you have this really powerful weapon and you have this really powerful strike as you win the game. And so that really feels engaging for the player because they feel like they've achieved something. So just another great example. I've got four images as well because I really wanted to sort of highlight that hyper casual games aren't just one game mechanic or one game mode or gameplay style. So these four are more sort of hyper casual games by quality. The first one being Teacher Simulator. With this one, you have this sort of mini game collection where you play the role of a teacher and you complete tasks in a school. At the end of each day, depending on how well you do, you earn a wage. And then with Object Hunt, you play the role of an object, you choose which object you want to be, and then you hide in the scene. And then there's a time limit for how long a hunter, so another player has to find you in that scene. If they don't find you within that team, uh, that time limit, then you win the game. But if they do, then they win the game. Then Jetpack Jump, this is another one where you run along and you jump with your jetpack and eventually you land and then whatever, wherever you land, your distance is calculated from the start point and that's your score. From that score, you earn coins where then you can upgrade, say, your fuel and your speed. And then that's really replayable. So going back to that 
uh, sort of key area of the uh, quote. You need to make sure that your games are replayable by the player so they can keep playing over and over. So in this case, you keep having this loop of jump, earn coins from the distance that you travel, go back, upgrade, and then travel further. And then finally, we have draw it. So the idea here is you're given a prompt and you have to draw it as quickly as possible. So once again, you play against other players and then you beat them by completing the drawing before they do. So they'll have their own prompts and then whoever gets theirs done first wins the game. So I've mentioned Quali a few times now, so I want to go over who Quali is. So we're a uh, mobile games developer and publisher. We're based in Lemton Spa. And so we were founded back in 2011 by our uh, co-founder, uh, David Darling, who's our current CEO. And he uh, also co-founded uh, Codemasters. We're a massive team now. So we, we hadn't reached it yet, but back in October, I think we're around like 86 people. And now we're well over 100 people and we're still growing. And part of this expansion is we now even have offices in Bangalore, India and Beijing, China. So I talk with people from across the world like on a daily basis when we're working on projects. And finally, I just want to mention that we're also a Women in Games ambassador. So that just means that we are committed to developing a inclusive and diverse culture within the company. So I've spoken about what hyper casual games are and my experience and how I got there. So how do we design hyper casual games? Well, first of all, you need to start off with coming up with a game idea. And the most obvious thing you need to do is research. So to start off with, the best thing you can do is whatever game you want to make, play games in that sort of genre. So if you want to make an action game, play a load of action games within that genre and see what you like about them. So as a few areas, note down, like, first of all, what the gameplay is. So how do they present a game mechanic to you? And what is that game mechanic? You know, is it easy to understand? Like, do you know, is it obvious from the start, like what you're doing and what should be going on in the scene? Then from that, see also what the visuals are. Visuals are very important for a game, especially on mobile. Like, as an example, the left image here, you have this large, you know, sort of spiked ball that you crash into buildings. But the visuals of the game are very sort of cartoonish and simple. So the textures don't really have much detail. They're basic colors. And that's very important because if we gave you all these realistic textures you know, across all these different grounds, it's going to draw your eye away from what's going on in the scene. And it will just seem very noisy and it just won't seem very pleasant to look at. So we help you focus on what's going on by keeping all the textures simple. And so that's just something to keep in mind if you're working on mobile, but even in other games. If you want to draw a player's attention to something, keep everything else simple or sort of less detailed to make sure they focus on what's going on. Another way of using visuals is on the right, this is a game that we made called Rocket Sky. And the visuals here are actually a part of the gameplay. So what you do is you have this rocket and when you hold down your finger on the screen, it fires off into the sky and you have a set fuel. Once that fuel runs out, you'll it'll stop you from going any further and then you'll reach a certain distance. That distance then gives you coins, kind of like back in Jetpack Jump. Now, the goal is to set um, reach certain scores like 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet. And when you reach those, you unlock new levels. And you can see those levels along the left hand side of the screen. So in this case, yes, you have these sort of nice cartoonish, uh, cartoonish visuals, but they're also used as a progression mechanic within the game. So that's maybe something you can do. Like it's very cosmetic and it's very sort of pleasing on the eye to suddenly go, oh wow, now I'm on like this sort of Martian planet or I've reached the moon. So it feels very sort of powerful as well for the player and very engaging. Obviously, when you look at these games, you need to make sure you look at what's working well. So what do you like about it? What would keep you know what would keep you in that game for a long period of time? What why do you keep coming back and playing it? Is it fun to see that say this building break down with like some sort of simulation? you know, sort of physics simulating and sort of seeing all these blocks break down, or do you just like the visuals of the game? Like all these things matter. And it's just something you should note down because they could be sort of targets for that you look at when you create your own games. And as you can imagine on top of that, look at what doesn't work so well. So is there something that really irritates you in the game? Is there something that would stop you from playing and never return? Now monetization is a big one because as I said, hyper casual games are free. So you need to make sure that you're able to support the development of these games. So most of this will be done through ads 
And so I just want to quickly go over the three main ads that you'd have to look at when you're playing these games. And you'll see them as well when you play them. So first we have interstitial ads. They'll play, there'll be like full screen ads that will appear between say levels. So you complete a level, you click continue, and then we'll show you an ad before you reach the next level. But then you also have uh, banner ads. So they'll just be sort of long uh, banners along the bottom of the top of the screen. And those ads will be sort of persistently there in front of you while you're playing. And finally, you have rewarded videos. So say you're running along a path and you're picking up coins, it's going to run a game. Uh, if you fall off the path for whatever reason, usually you'll see a video pop up and say, do you want to watch this ad to continue from where you were? And then usually you'll hit that because you're getting something in return. You know, you're being rewarded for watching an ad. So definitely look at those when you're designing mobile games. So I've explained like how to look at sort of games and what to note down. But obviously you want to come up with your own game idea, something unique. And a popular thing to look at is actually what's trending. Like what online are people playing? What are they looking at? What are they watching? So straight away, video games. Look at what's popular. Go and look at sort of charts and see what are people playing? Why do they like those games? It's, it's very good to see how people review games as well, because they will say what works well and what doesn't. So that'll just help towards your research. But video games aren't the only thing you should look at. Other mediums such as, say, movies are great because maybe you could watch a movie which is very popular and it has a amazing fight sequence. Maybe there's something in that sequence that the main protagonist does that you can turn into a game mechanic. Like, honestly, game ideas can come from anywhere. So don't sort of throw anything out. Like, it can honestly come from anywhere. And, of course, trends, the most likely place that you'll see them is social media. So on social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you'll find these trending hashtags or these trending topics. And so see, maybe there's something there that, okay, maybe a certain kind of object is trending. Maybe there's a way of turning an object into something you can play with like, in a game. And finally, I've gone over this a couple of times sort of, uh, slightly, and that's real life. Like the number of ideas that you could maybe pull just from your daily routine. Like it sounds boring, but like maybe from brushing your teeth, there's something in there that you can actually turn into a game. And already, you know that people understand it because everyone brushes their teeth and everyone understands how that functions and what's involved. So you really then get over that hurdle of explaining what your game is to a player. So let's go through this. So let's say you have your idea now. Where do you go from here? Well, if I come up with an idea, let's say, OK, I'm going to pick real life. And I know I'm going to go for that amazing thing of just eating a bowl of pasta. I pick up pasta with a fork. I know, very exciting. And so what do I do with that? Maybe I think that could be a game mechanic. So where should I go from here? So what's next? Well, at Quali, we use this template here. And what we call this is a one page spec. So the reason we fill this in with our game idea is to see if we can get into its simplest form and just get down to the core mechanic of the game. This is important because if you want to make a mobile game, it has to be as simple as you can possibly make it. You're not going to just fill it up with systems and it's going to work because you filled up with like an extra cosmetic system or this or that. So this really helps us get down to what is our game idea. So yeah, this page is all about just summarizing what you have in one slide. So we really have to restrict it down. So you start off by just including a couple of sentences, keeping about two or three. And here you explain what the game idea is, where the premise came from. And of course, it's a game. So then you have to explain how does it function? What are the controls? How does the player interact with this mechanic? So that's going to be very important in sort of selling the idea that this could be a game that people would play. This is a very important one because I found that if you really want to explain the idea, include a visual element, create mock-ups of how the game could look. So you could add in a box, which is like the you know, screen ratio of a mobile phone and then start adding all the elements and just show like this is what the player would see. Yes, it'll be in a rough form, but it just helps people imagine what the game idea is. And at the end of the day, no one wants to read a wall of text, uh, just a wall of text. So if you're able to explain things through images, it will just be far more engaging for whoever has to read the document at the end of the day. So we found this to be very useful recently and something I'm still learning, but include references. So if I'm talking about my amazing bowl of pasta, I should include an image of it because they can already see, oh, OK, so that's where you got the idea from. And it maybe give them ideas for how the idea can be developed further. So any kind of inspiration or references, you can include them in the slide as well. So if I do all that, 
let's say I come up with this. This is for my amazing food fork 3D idea. I use a few sentences to explain what the game idea is. I talk about the controls. So I say like, okay, you move left and right on this path and you, you know, pierce food that comes along the way. But I also talk about obstacles. So explain like, you know, remember to think about ideas or elements that will make the game challenging for the player. Now, one thing I want to point out here as well is, as you can tell, I've used bullet points. We found this to be very, uh, sort of, far easier for someone to understand and clearer if you use bullet points rather than just writing a paragraph. First of all, it restricts how much you, you can write. But secondly, it just makes it far quicker for someone to understand your game idea. They can read through those bullet points in, say, 10, 20 seconds, and then they know what the, the idea is about. Especially in hyper casual games, you'll get through so many ideas. So keeping it simple from the start and then seeing how it goes from there is a really good idea. So you've got your game idea. Where do you go from there? You've made your one page spec. Well, at Quality, we then go to a brainstorm meeting. And in a brainstorm meeting, we all sit down as designers and we present our game ideas to each other. So we would get a one page spec up, explain what the idea is. And this is very important because now it's your chance to get feedback. As scary as it can be to get feedback, it is going to be one of the most important things you'll ever get on a design. I found that being a creative, you know, for anyone who's create a creative individual, you're probably going to end up getting very passionate or sort of inspired by an idea and you'll run with it. But then you might get this, you might develop this kind of like tunnel vision where you don't see maybe the pitfalls or the issues with the design or the game mechanic. So getting someone who's like outside of, sort of the loop of where you are with that sort of inspiration, you know, passion, they, they'll just be completely honest about what they think about it and if they would play it. So make sure you get feedback. Always get feedback when you can on a design. It's the best way to improve it. Furthermore, like if, if I came to a brainstorm and my idea, I present it and it's not strong enough, for whatever reason that could be, usually we end up then developing it further as a team. So someone might say, oh, well, I think there's an issue here, but maybe this game can't, just won't resonate with people. People won't understand it. But then someone else in the team might just suggest, well, if we tweak this or change you know, the object or how we present this to the player by changing this camera angle or this or that, it, it honestly it becomes a really collaborative experience. And then you get to work on a, a design together and make it something that is then strong enough to go out as a game idea and see, is this going to go well? <clears throat> and of course, when you do all this, please write it all down. It, the, you know, especially with the brainstorm meetings, if you go through like a load of ideas, I found that it can be very easy to forget maybe the feedback you got on your design when there's like three or four other pictures coming after you. So in any any meeting that you have, make sure you write down notes for that meeting. You'll be surprised how quickly you'll forget what got said as soon as you leave. Or maybe you think you remember it all, but there'll be some important points that you've completely missed and you just completely forget, but you don't realise. And obviously, if you're writing it all down, it just makes it far easier to uh, change it later. So if I'm working on a one-page spec, we, we do this in, say, Google Slides. I will then just add in like a rectangle shape element and then just add on feedback right on that slide. Therefore, I don't need to go and hunt for some document that I've written the feedback down in. It's like right there in front of me on the pitch that it's referencing. So it makes it far easier to iterate if I have to do so at a later date. So what's next? Well, let's quickly cover where we've got to so far. So we've done our one page spec. That's gone well. We've written it down. We think it's gonna be the best thing ever. We take it to a brainstorm and you know maybe we've improved it a bit. But unfortunately, at this point, you still need to get approval. So it's not fully there yet. So now you'll get um, the approval from management. And either, as you can imagine, this will go either one of two ways. So yes, unfortunately, it can happen where the game idea isn't strong enough. And what it means is you then go back and you reiterate. You find another way of improving the design so that it does get approval. And eventually, then you get that yes, where you can move on to creating a design document. So what is a design document? Well. This is where you can now really sort of flesh out your idea. The one page spec really tries to limit you to just writing down the core idea and keeping it there in its core state. Now you can really expand on it and come up with like maybe levels or different mechanics or obstacles. And this is where you can add in those details and habits sort of on paper in a document. So some key things to remember when you're writing documents is you need to remember that it, as a design document, especially you've got other people reading it. That's, that's the most important thing is you need to make sure that what you're writing, people, other people understand. So you might make references to a game 
and they've never played that game. They won't understand the reference as an example. So then you need to make sure you include maybe an, an image or a capture or a GIF or something that just shows what that game is and what you're referring to. So definitely make sure you keep it as simple as possible. And remember other teammates. So especially for those who are now doing group projects or got group, group projects coming up, if you're working on design together or you're working on a plan or whatever it is, you need to make sure that it's referring to everyone and it's, it's it works for everyone. So what I'm referring to here is if you're a designer, you've got an artist and a programmer, probably multiple, and they need to know different bits of information for their roles. So for an artist, what we do is we create a mood board of images to explain what the visual style is of the game. And, you know, visual style can be very sort of interpretive. So I'd say this might not always work, but in date it opens up that conversation for you to now talk to the artist and then start pointing out parts of the image of like, well, I was thinking like this, but then we mix it with like the way they've textured this character in this image with the lighting from this scene that I found. And then you sort of work together to find a solution to what the visual style is until you're both on the same page. But then equally importantly, as equally important, you need to make sure that programmers can understand what the game mechanics are. So if I'm designing a mechanic for a game, and I know a programmer's going to be reading it, I'll usually do flowcharts because then it's sort of very logical and I make sure that I am thinking of all the steps involved. Even as, if I go for a simple example, like pick up a coin, I'll include a flowchart of, OK, this is the state that you that will lead you to pick up that coin. I will then show how you pick up the coin. So maybe, OK, the state to get you there is you're running along the path and you're walking up to a, a coin and then colliding with it. That's what causes you to pick up the coin. So what happens then? Well, you might have like a little bit of VFX, like you might have like some coins sort of spit out or you have like some light, you know, light effect or something to show, OK, this has been picked up. And then you need to show what happens immediately afterwards. So do they get that coin? Does it add on to a counter? Does that appear above them or like behind them or follows them around? Like you need to make sure those details are in there to make sure that a program can then put them in the game. And like with the one page spec, it's just as important here, include visual elements. I said no one wants to read a wall of text. Yes, you can include more text here, but the more you can do in images, the far easier and engaging it's going to be to for someone else to understand what is going on. And of course, please always remember the scope of the project. Like you'll have a rough idea for how long you're spending on something. And then from there, you just need to make sure that whatever you come up with is possible. And the best thing to do is just come up with something simple. Don't expand on it from day one. Just make a core make, you know, game mechanic, create that first and then expand on it. So, you know, if you're making a game within, say, two months, you're not going to be making some AAA title. You're going to be making something small, that sort of very, it has to be very feasible. One thing that I would recommend here, and it's something we do as well at Quali, is in our documents, we'll have like an extra page where we have ideas for later. So you could be designing your game and you've just got to work on the core stuff, but maybe you've got an idea for how you can expand on that in the future. Try not to include it in the core design now. Leave it on that page for later. It's something you can return to when you have time. Get the rest, get the core game first out of the way built and done, and then move on to these extra ideas. And of course, always get feedback from various people as well. So not even just from your teammates, but maybe you can get you know, feedback from other people who don't even play games and see how do they react to your game. But even if you do, do talk to designers, they can then help you go you know, point out where maybe the pitfalls are or where there could be issues in the game later on. So get sort of a wide ranging sort of sources for when you get feedback. It's always going to help you at the end of the day. So then there's that big looming question when you're doing these documents and writing up these amazing ideas is how do you know your design is going to be good? How can you be sure that it's going to be like the next big thing? Well, obviously there's no clear path for how you can know that, but there's definitely some questions you can ask yourself at each step of the process to see, do you have an answer for it to justify your design? So here are the following questions that I feel you should ask yourself. First of all, how is the game exciting and will it draw people in? So especially say on a mobile platform, you have so many games coming out that you need to make sure that you have come up with something that's different or something that's going to be just so much fun that it's going to draw people in and get them to install it. So at every stage, if you're coming up with a game idea, then think to yourself, am I even excited to play it? 
it, it was a surprise you were how many ideas where people come up with an idea and they think, okay, well, definitely the audience will play this. But if you're not excited about it yourself, then maybe you should rethink that and see if you can rework it. So you need to see if you're passionate about the design and then feedback will help you then sort of rein that into an idea that's then feasible and also that will work. Is the theme and gameplay universally understood and popular? This is a very important one because especially say for mobile games or a mobile platform, everyone can access that game from across the world. So you need to make sure that whatever gameplay mechanics you include or any visuals or themes are easily understood for, across the world. It could even be from what colours you use. You know, colours can mean different things in different parts of the world, but also the gameplay mechanic. Maybe you pick something that could be, I don't know, very sort of British, but then someone from outside of Britain might not understand what you're referring to or what you're on about. So make sure that whatever you come up with is something that those people, you know, well, the world will hopefully understand. And of course, is your game going to feel engaging and is it going to be very rewarding? So the best way to engage a player is to make sure that you reward them at different stages for what they're doing. You know, they need to feel like it's worth investing their time in when they're playing this game. So make sure you reward them appropriately. Say at the end of the level, they earn a certain amount of coins just to keep them playing and make sure that loop is in there and it's strong so that at the end of every level, they earn something for progressing further. They need to feel that if they progress further, they're going to get something for their investment. So the other one I want to talk about and it is a bit harder to talk about, but uh, is A-B testing. So I've got another amazing sort of long quote, but I'll explain it. Um, so Game Analytics came up with this uh, nice way of describing A-B testing, where A-B testing is a data-driven way to optimize your game. You introduce small changes to a sample of users and observe their effects. You ultimately take away the guesswork around design decisions in your game. So this one's a tough one because, yes, it's very helpful, but it's something you can do when your game's out there and is being played. So what this is referring to is, You'll come up with, say, a mechanic where maybe, okay, maybe you pick up coins and you need a certain amount of coins to complete a level. What you can do is you can test how many coins they need to complete a level to um, see how players react to that. And I'll include that here as my example as well. So, first of all, yeah, think about the different aspects. In this case, I'm thinking of coins and because they're part of how you complete a level and how you progress. And so, I start thinking about, OK, well, so far I've got a certain amount of coins. They were, say, a point each. I need 10 of those to complete a level. But then I think, you know what, maybe people would prefer it if it was two points per coin, because at that point they're completing levels faster and then they just get through. You know, they progress far quicker than they would in the original version. But I can't know for sure if one will work over the other. So what I do here is I give both those values to, sort of say, the programmers and I say, right, Let's test this where 50% of the audience now gets one value and 50% gets the other value. And then usually after a few weeks, you then get data back where you look at the um, metrics of the game. And what I'm referring to there is you could look at, say, the retention or so like how long someone's playing for, how many sessions people are completing, and then use that to work out which value is working the best in the game. So in this case, I might go, yep. Yeah, Longest retention wins. So if you stay in the game longer by using you know, if the players from the two points per coin group are playing longer than the one point group, then that's successful because we've changed a value where by changing that value, you, you keep players in the game longer. So this is just a way of testing different values and then seeing how your audience reacts. And the reason why it takes the guesswork it out is because then it's all data driven. And that's a big part of mobile games, but then just games in general where people are trying to use data more and more now to see if they can work out values for the game that makes sense and that the audience are going to respond to. But my final thing here is it's not even just A, B testing. Like you can do A, B, C, D testing, which is an actual thing. So instead of just doing two values, you can have four groups of people or five groups of people and test out various values and see how they react to them. So what's it like to be a designer? So the best way I thought of don't go through this is just go through the main points of my day and how I, what's so just everything I do in a day uh, at Quali. So I'll get the obvious one out of the way, obviously documents. So I'm doing loads of one page specs, design documents, iterations on both of those every day. Because um, those do, you know, design documents need to be up to date and sort of fully functioning and uh, sort of well designed by the end of a, you know, a certain period of time to make sure that then a programmer or an artist can then come onto the project and use that to then make that into a, a reality. 
But also on top of that, um, I do a lot of level design. So an example I'll give here is uh, there's a game we released recently called Foam Climber. And so a part of that project was uh, I, I was a level designer. So I was in Unity making levels. I've also put here requesting level design tools because that's an important aspect that I wanted to make sure I covered. So as well as being a designer making these levels, I also need to work out what I need from an artist and a programmer to be able to make those levels. So for example, in this image, you can see that there's a red wall with spikes coming out. So you obviously already know that it's dangerous. It's an obstacle you need to overcome, but I need then someone to make that obstacle. So what will happen is I'll work these out in the design document. An artist will then make the visual elements. They'll make the actual mesh and the textures and the materials. And then a program will set it up so that when the player hits it, they'll be eliminated or sort of removed from the level. So as a designer, you're responsible for doing both those things. You tell uh, an artist or programmer what you need, and then as a designer, you come up with the level and then test it yourself. Play testing is a very important part of it. As a designer, you're kind of like designing QA, so you also make sure that the level's working before you submit it. Another obvious one I want to get out of the way is meetings. So I've already mentioned brainstorms. We do those on a weekly basis, but as well as brainstorms, we have stand-ups. So for those who don't know, stand-ups is a meeting where every morning you'll get together with everyone else working on a project and you first go one by one, explain what you've been working on, but then also you say what you can be working on that day. This is really good practice to have, especially for say your group projects, because then you keep everyone in the loop of the pro progress of the game. And for whoever's running a project, it helps them keep focus on, okay, what's been done, what still needs doing. And this is also like a, the point in the meeting where you then come up with, if there's anything that's blocking you or stopping you or preventing you from completing a task, you can then come up with solutions in that meeting. It's definitely worth doing. And the final one I'll mention for meetings is uh, what we refer to as ad hoc meetings. So these can just happen any time. It's just where if an issue comes up or there's a problem, you'll have a meeting to then discuss it. It can be far easier to sit down and talk to someone, say, over a call and you know, over a video call than typing it out in the chat. Typing things out in the chat can take ages and then just talking it out in person like, over a call can just really help uh, speed things up. So I'd highly recommend that if you're working in group projects, do your meetings in a call rather than, say, over chat or, or text or whatever else. And finally, project management. This is one I definitely had to learn um, sort of as I went along. But um, at Quali, we have a wide range of projects from large ones to sort of much smaller ones. If there's a smaller project that, say, I'm the designer for, so I designed the, you know, I came up with the document and it's my design, I'm basically then playing the role of designer slash like man and project manager. And so what I do here is I just make sure that every day I check in with the project and the people working on it and see how things are going what needs doing and the progress so far. But on top of that, I'm also there to make sure that the design is being adhered to by everyone in the team. That's very important because the designer I've come up with and the document I've written is what's then been approved and that's what's expected. So I need to make sure as a designer that what the, say, videos or content that's being created and being published is what I've put in that design document. Because you'll be surprised, it can be very easy to, you know, misinterpret or misunderstand something in a design document. So it's in your job to make sure that that's rectified and sort of kept to what's been said. So summary and tips. So I'm getting to the end of the presentation now. Um, I'm mostly going over a sort of summary of the design process, but to quickly summarize like my experience, definitely make sure you have a portfolio, make sure that it's easy to find, keep links on LinkedIn and Twitter and whatever professional social media you have or using. Um, just make sure that if there's any experiences or any placements, yes, I know it's a we're, we're living in strange times at the moment, but if there's any kind of experience or placements that come up, definitely consider them and see what's out there. And finally, if you're in a position now where you're applying for jobs, as hard as it can be to keep going after you know you get a few no's, and I, I've been there, just keep going, keep you know keep just moving forward. Like I went through, like. 40 or 50 different applications before I even came across quality as a company. So definitely just keep going and um, eventually you'll find something. So my first tip here is don't always feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. See what's like already working in games. This is a big one just because I've, I've met lots of designs now where 
they want to make something the most unique thing which has never been done before. And as amazing as creative as it is, it can usually lead to something that then doesn't in the end work because it's just so untested and has nothing to back it up. There's no problem in seeing what already works and finding how, ways to incorporate that in your design. So maybe you have a unique mechanic, but maybe the way you present it, you can see what, how other games present new features or new elements to a game to a player and then use that to hopefully ease that introduction to new stuff in your game. I've said it quite a few times now, I'll say it again. Feedback is very valuable. Definitely always find time to have feedback on your designs and always consider it. That you'll be surprised how much you might miss on a design and then someone else will just say it and it will just come to you like, oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. So always consider it and don't always take it as, um, you know, don't take it badly. And what I mean by that is, you know, feedback is not always going to be positive, but the negative feedback, don't take it as negative. Take it as like targets for improvement. And say, let's try and help you come up with a better design. So if it leads to a better product, you should always see it as a positive. This one is great for design documents, especially when you're writing more text. But like, make sure that when you're writing it, assume that it's being written for someone who doesn't maybe play games or doesn't really understand games. Yes, I know if you're working in group projects, you know, you'll be writing documents for say your, you know, that your tutors will read and they have a great amount of experience in games. But to make it far easier to read and understand, it's always good to assume that someone who's reading it doesn't know anything about games. And then that forces you to then keep it really straightforward and simple as well. And if you're referencing another game, make sure to you know include visual elements to help with that. Always consider your other team members. So as I said, when you write designs, consider art, they need to know what the visual style is, and consider programmers, they need to understand how mechanics work. Include flowcharts, include sort of visual diagrams for how a mechanic should work, you know, step by step. Short and sweet, no babble. This is something that I've definitely been learning a lot of over the last you know, few years especially. Um, I can write a lot in a document and at the end of the day, half of it probably won't be necessary. And also you should see it as maybe a bad sign. Um, I found that if you've got a core, you know, core game mechanic, but maybe you don't think it's that strong, you'll just naturally start adding systems to it if you think it will improve it. But the way I'd see it is always consider your core gameplay as like the foundation of a building and anything you add on top as those extra stories. And so if that core gameplay doesn't work, it will eventually just break down and anything that you build on top of it is going to break down with it. So definitely try and keep it short and sweet to see what the game what core gameplay is and test that out first. So more tips, I'll make this quick though. So first of all, it's something that might not work for everyone, but it definitely worked for me is when I came back from placement and went to final year, I treated university as a job. I worked nine to five. So I got into university at nine and finished by five. This first of all means that then you have, you can enjoy your evenings. But on top of that, you've got a time frame. You know you've got eight hours a day, so you can then you've got something to plan out. The number of times where maybe because you can work any time of the day, you'll just go, oh, I'll do it later, and then it gets to like maybe ten o'clock and you haven't done it yet. Just make sure you have a time of say like five o'clock, and then you can make sure you can get it done, and then just relax in the evenings and enjoy yourself. It's good to have that work-life balance. So this is one way that I achieved it when I was at university. Uh, Try and use a task system. So personally, I use Google Tasks. We uh, use Google Counts and Google Calendar, and it's integrated. But as another example, uh, Microsoft To Do. The reason why this is important is you need to make sure that you write your tasks down to, so you don't rely on yourself to remember it. I, I found that if I was at university, it probably just leads to more stress if I'm trying to remember everything just off the top of my head. So if you have it written down, you have it sort of in like a task management system that you can tick off as you go. That'll just really help you stay organized throughout. And on top of that, use a calendar. Keep note of meetings, have them scheduled, so then you can get notifications pushed to you for when they're coming up. And if you're working group projects or any kind of project, always leave that sort of buffer room for mistakes. At the end of the day, you want to make sure you finish it before the deadline so you have time to play test it and then get feedback and fix any kind of issues or anything that'll come up. I promise you that even with the best intentions, something can get, will go wrong. And so you need to make sure you have time to fix things. And so part of that is also so do that in the planning stage. Make sure you plan out your projects so you know how much time you have and what you can do when. And this next one is going to be one that your tutors have already spoken about, but I want to iterate here as well is please back up. 
like I've, I've got horror stories where work goes missing like a week before the deadline that's like months of work gone don't do that have an external hard drive keep it backed up you'll you'll be surprised where if something does go wrong you're going to feel so relieved when you have that external hard drive with a copy of it you can work from so please do it and finally meeting notes so any meeting you have with your tutor with your group whatever keep notes i've had even meetings at quality where we come up in the meeting it's been like maybe a two-hour meeting not everyone's going to remember what happened within that first hour because of everything got said later so keeping notes can then help everyone reflect back on what that meeting included so yeah that's the end of my presentation i just want to say thank you so much for listening and i hope you found this very helpful thank you Thank you, Alex. Look, you're getting some uh, rounds of applause there. Well done, Dave. Very, very well done. Um, if you want to unshare your screen so we sort of can see you a bit yep. better, that'd be awesome. Cool. Definitely some uh, food, uh, food for thought there in terms of obviously the hyper casual market. Um, it's all like data driven retention trying to keep on trends, which is very difficult, which is why it's data driven in the first place. Uh, and it's obviously about creating projects in such a, a short space of time, which is, so how do you find that from a, from a question for me first, before I open it up to the rest of the audience, how do you find, because um, you, you do both art and design, do you find the projects, do you like the short projects in terms of, uh, you know, how long they take? You say two months typically, is that right? Not even that, there are projects where even smaller ones will take a month or so. It all depends on the scope of the project, but I, I really like that sort of quick turnover of projects. Yeah. I It feels very sort of invigorating just because, you know, one game will be completely different to another, and then just going from one to the next, it always keeps you sort of on your toes, and I really like that about working in this industry and working in hyper-casual games especially. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I usually hear. It's, it's quite, it's different all the time. You're constantly, and obviously you can move within projects as well, depending. Mm. Um, so it's you're constantly you know doing different things, which is really nice. Okay, um, uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions, if you raise your hands or put any messages into the uh, chat, we can try and get through some through. Awesome. Uh, we've got Joe Darcy first. Do you want to ask uh, Alex a question? Is Joe with us? Okay, um, I'm going to go to Mirren. Oh. Oh. That's you me. need to unmute, John. <laughs> oh, oh. Sorry, I have to unmute the gremlins. I forgot to do that. Okay, oh, sorry, sorry, I sorry, I was just try, muted. Let's try Joe again. Joe was probably yeah, yeah, screaming I'm, I'm at here. me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to get through. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was awesome. It's really cool to hear. Um, like a bit like a detailed explanation of how the hyper casual works um i was just wondering like you've obviously now worked on just a huge amount of games compared to say if you worked on a triple a title mm -hmm. you might be on one game for uh, multiple months um have you found that's been like a massive boost because uh, you said about game jams and we've been messing around with those ourselves um has it boosted your experience and just your learning presumably has just been insane because you've just had so many different uh projects to work on everything's been different uh, mechanics and stuff mm. has that really been, made a big difference to how fast you developed as a as a designer oh 100 percent. because as i explained explain about hyper casual games it's there's not just like one game mode or one sort of ca camera view you have to learn about it all so I've, i'll design some games that are first person some are third person so it, i've had to learn about all those and sort of learn on my feet so it's it's really helped having to jump from project to project because as well as working on like a project you know quickly like for two weeks and then move on to the next one i'm usually working on three or four three or four projects at a time like of different scales so um yeah learning all that at once has, has been great and just, yeah very been very rewarding as well so sounds really cool it sounds like an exciting it sounds yeah. like a constant game jam in my mind but obviously oh, there's more to it yeah. than that but it's like it sounds like you've got all the fun creative bit about any of the horrible dragged out bit. but yeah it's really cool it's fascinating to you talk cheers appreciate it thank you so much thank you um, I can't see Alex. Is that my side, or is everyone, can everyone else see Alex? Yeah, I can um, see. You can see. Oh my! I, I think my, my machine just needs a bit of a rest. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. I um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to 
Let's see, Mir Mirren was next, wasn't he? Yeah, let's go to Mirren. Go on, Mirren, fire away. You seem so disappointed. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm just going to Alex. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, that's, uh, in chat, someone asked, uh, how do you know what's core and what's not core? And as much as I tend to instinctively know, I have no idea how to answer that question. So, I thought I'd put it to you. Ooh, that is a really good question. I mean, so I'm, I'm a junior games so I've been in it for three months now. And I, I'll be honest, like, even I still struggle with that, like working out, okay, this system I think is definitely important to it and can't work without it. And then people will find ways around it. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. It's, it's just working out. The best way I do it is I, if I come up with a game idea, I just start taking pieces away from it. And then I see, OK, well, does this game still function if I take this away from it? Like if I now don't pick up this object or don't have this obstacle, would it still work? And then just through a sort of like an elimination progress uh, process, you then realize, OK, the game can work with like these two mechanics, but these other four that I've got currently there, it doesn't need. Because if I take it away, it still functions as a game. Yeah. So thank you very much for that question. OK, thank you. Um, that's excellent. Uh, Matthew Mason, do you want to ask a question? Hey, good to see hey. you again, Alex. Likewise. Uh, I was just wondering, so in all of Ollie Christie's um, talks, whenever he comes here, he always mentions his development process over at Neon Play. I was um, wondering, how do you think um, Quali's uh, development pipeline changes in comparison? I mean, that's a tough question for me to answer because I don't really know the development pipeline of uh, Neon play, uh, and so how it compares. Um, See, so unfortunately, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know too much about neon play in that regard to the development. That's fair. But thank you very much, though. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Um, Kai Esme. Hey. Hello. <laughs> hey, you're a grown up now, man. What the hell? It's unbelievable. He's not um, wearing a tie. He's fine. <laughs> Well, my question, Alex, is uh, what's the best bit about working at Quali for you? It is like just the trust people have in me. So as I said, I, I, I didn't go into it thinking I'd be doing it, but just doing the project management side as well as being a designer. So yes, I write a design document, but the next minute I'm going back to a project I work on and I'm checking in to see how people are doing. I just love how quickly, like in a day, there's the number of tasks I can get through I can understand that at large companies and different types of games, other than hyper casual, it can be you work on like a single task for like a week or two. And I've had other companies that I've worked at where that's happened. But um, yeah, just being able to quickly jump like one hour, you work on one thing and go to the next. It really sort of keeps you, sounds weird to say, but like awake and you feel just like always excited because you don't know what's coming up. So I've really loved that about Kawadi, just jumping from project to project and seeing the trust they instill in me to, you know, do the job essentially so that's, that's been great and the support there has been amazing as well so yeah i feel very fortunate thank you very much kai awesome thank you any questions from anybody else well i have a question so um alex how is it for you as a designer to have to work with uh metrics with user data hmm. it's tough i mean because it's something that i you know I like being the creative person ourselves as an artist as well, but um, the metrics are still something I learn about. But um, especially with like A/B testing, uh, we we now do it a lot more, and so we do a lot of sheets in that. In terms of how I deal with it, it's just learning as I go currently. But um, I mean, we have people that sort of specialize in that as well at the company, so we mm -hmm. really sort of see the end result. They show us like the figures, but then also they show, okay, so that means that this is what's come out, or this is what this means. So um, yeah. Because it can be quite, I, I, I just imagine that it can be quite brutal, right? You have this amazing mm. idea and you're all full of it. And then it goes into A-B testing and the computer says no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, especially when you design a whole A-B test and you think, OK, if I change this value, it's definitely going to improve. Like, players are going to play this like 10 times more, aren't they? And it mm. comes back and goes, yeah, it, it actually got worse. Like, people are playing it less <laughs> yeah. now. So, no, we're not doing that. Like, damn. So it really sort of, yeah, it keeps you humble, I guess. <laughs> but thank you very much for the question. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Andre. Uh, Emma, you got a question to ask? 
Hi, hi Alex, it's good to see you again. Hey, likewise. Um, I was just wondering how long after you, well, when did you start applying for jobs in your final year? Like, did you start applying straight away or towards the end of the year? So for me, I started applying when we hit sort of New Year in January of that final year. Um, I mean, that's tough because like, I know there's some companies that are looking for stuff before Christmas, but I, I started like early January, I started looking at jobs and so yes, I do my group work and all that throughout the week and then just spend a couple hours on like the weekend to then apply for jobs. So yeah, I'll start from like January onwards. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Emma. Uh, Alexander Day, got a question for Alex? Uh, yeah, hey Alex, when you were applying for jobs, did you tailor your portfolio at all for what you wanted to do? Kind of. Okay, I'll say not really, because I the same content. My port, I wouldn't give my a sort of special version like my portfolio, so they'd see just level design or this or that. But so I use I keep my my portfolio on a site called ArtStation, and that's what I use. But then I'm able to break down my content into categories. So I have a category for say like level design or three D art, so procedural materials. And so they can see all from when they go to my portfolio, they can see all the same content, but then they can very quickly click on a link and it will break it down to just here are the procedural materials or here's this category. So um, that's the way I sort of did it. It's a smart way of doing it. Yeah, great. Thanks. No problem. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, next, we've got uh, Mr. Finn Valley. You got a question for Alex? Hey, dude. Hey. Good to see you, man. Good to see that you're doing well. You're looking well. Um, <laughs> Do you feel like there's a sort of key area or a key skill um, that is crucial for you in your job as a designer uh, that you maybe didn't use or underdeveloped at university? Ooh. Um, I would definitely say communication. Commu like, because, you know, it's, it's a tough one. But like, yeah, I, I, teamwork is how, you know, teamwork is fundamental to making games. And if something goes wrong in a project, usually, like I found, it's down to misinterpretation or just there wasn't enough communication between certain people in the group. And um, so, in my case, like it's communication I had to develop very quickly and just learn to keep in say constant contact with people in the group to say, "Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Everything going okay? Is there anything stopping you from completing this or that?" Um, so, communication is definitely key to any project or you know, game project, especially as well. So, awesome. yeah. Thanks, dude. Thank you very much. Good to hear from you. Thanks, Fern. Uh, Matthew Mason. Hey. Um, Hello. What What would you th <laughs> What do you think has been uh, sort of the biggest change going from something like well assignments like the group projects into mm -hmm. industry work? I would say oof, it's. The biggest thing will be, you know, the meeting new people. And what I mean by that is because, you know, the people I worked with in my phone group project, I knew them for, say, a couple of years before that. And for any new company you go to, you have to sort of meet people and sort of get to know them and work with them. So that's a really, that was, that was a big change. Um, and then just sort of understanding how to work with different people. And, you know, everyone has their own way of working and sort of learning to work around that to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and can do their job and all that. So I'd say that was the biggest thing, meet new people. But as long as, as well as that, it's just knowing that these projects have to go out to an audience that then has that will play it. So um, you 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 feel very responsible for making sure you do it right because you know you have all these people that will have to play it in the end day, and they, you want to make sure they have fun and enjoy the game. So those two are probably my top two. Got to make sure work on the professionalism. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Good question, Matt. Thank you. Um, James Bradbury. Hi, Alex. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I was going to ask, uh, what is the culture like in Quali? Are you expected to work overtime or anything like that? Or uh, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, the culture is. It's been amazing. First of all, it was it was very my my joining the companies was like a very sort of warm welcome it was great to meet everyone and i i i honestly I'm, I'm i've not had a single bad experience with anyone in the company like everyone's been very welcoming like just 
bumping into our COO in the kitchen like when I was like I worked like three days in the office before I went to remote work and he was going oh how you doing so it's just like it, was, it felt really bizarre like oh, the CEO of the company but um but then even from there to like talking to other juniors like everyone was just like very nice and easy to get along with and yeah it is just a very sort of diverse and inclusive culture I, I never felt like I was at a disadvantage for having the title of junior I think that's been more of a chip on my shoulder than with anyone else um where if I'm running a project I'm like well I'm just a junior design designer should I be doing this but so it's just uh it's been very sort of humbling but also it's yeah it's been amazing I, it's, it's a, they've got a great culture and it's a very sort of friendly and open culture so I really appreciate it but I also appreciate the question thank you so much I think uh, Quali is still hiring aren't they uh, Alex yeah yeah very much so so especially for you graduates out there <laughs> go become Alex's colleague so you can harass him all day <laughs> Thanks, Andre. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm going to let Alex go at 10 past for another, well, just another few minutes. Any, any more questions? Or do you want to say one more last thing, Alex, before you go? Because uh, obviously I'm aware of time on your side. Sure. I, well, I just want to say thank you so much for letting me be a part of your GameX. It, it feels so surreal because you know, only last year I was attending GameX myself listen to speakers and now I'm here talking to you about my experience and I was going to say like always just sort of stay hopeful and happy like you know I, I had a great time at university I'm having a great time now and yeah I just hope you all do well and I wish you guys all the best like you know we're under the, these very strange times but you know just thank you so much for having me and I wish you all all the best okay awesome um thank you very much um, Mirren, have you got one last uh, question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, it's also to the course leaders, uh, because you said that you sort of were here last year just listening to GameX. I was wondering if the feeling of uh, being a junior or new to this ever really wears off, or if you always tend to feel like you don't know as much as everyone else. Ooh. I think, I th well, well, Alice, go first. You're the oh. junior. <laughs> I'd, I'd just say that there's, there's always, like, you, you've never learned everything. There's always something to learn. And it's just, once that becomes obvious, it's just, yeah, you might always feel like a junior, but, okay, it's going to sound really weird, but, like, my, the best quote I found was that, the, like, the, the main animators came up with, like, the Disney style of animation. The, the thing that kept them going for all those years is they always had the sort of, they, they always acted like students, basically. They always wanted to learn more. So don't ever feel like you've reached the top or something. Always keep learning, because then before you know it, you're behind on the time. So just, yeah, I might still have the, you know, feel like a junior, but I like that though. I want to keep learning and just feel like I've got more to learn. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was going to say exactly the same. <laughs> I'm a little bit older than Alex, but I still feel like a junior. It's like there's always people that are that are that know stuff that you would love to know, right? And that can do stuff that you would love to do. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, right? It keeps you on your toes and it keeps you doing new stuff and 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 experimenting and learning. So I think that's that's just that's fine. Okay. Um, I think we should all give call it a day, but thank you so much, Alex, and we'll all give you a round of applause. I think he deserves a round of applause, so well done, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Definitely be in touch, and uh, it'd be great to actually have you come into the campus at some point as well and see us all <laughs> when it all returns to normal. Yeah, we'd love to. Okay. Well, Alex, you actually need, you still need to graduate, don't you? You still need to graduate. <laughs> sure, <right>? Yep. <laughs> You've got November. graduation to look forward to. So yeah, hopefully that will happen and uh, we can have a beer. That would be great. Yes. So yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, story. It's been really good. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. See you, Alex. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Right, cheers. Bye. bye.